Uh, afternoon. I think uh, getting a, a Scotsman and a Welshwoman to the uh, Oval is uh, that's a small <laughs> miracle in itself. So good work. Still don't understand cricket. So good luck, Olivia. Um, so, uh, yeah, so today we just want to talk about millennials and centennials in terms of we hear this talk about them as they're this alien species. What should we do about them? How do we tackle them? How different are they? How different are they? from each other, which uh, goes back to a bit of, uh, a little bit of rewind. We launched as an agency about uh, two years ago, and one of my sort of starting principles was the whole relationship between people and brands has changed. So if the relationship between people and brands has changed, you would have to, uh, can we move on just one slide actually? Is this right? Oh, sorry, okay, okay, thank you. Boom. Okay, um, so if you start with the uh, principle that uh, brands and uh, people relationships have changed, you would argue, therefore, agencies have to change, which, um, yet yeah, again, going back to uh, Olivia's presentation, all sounds a lot easier than it is, but we started to do some research to sort of try and prove that. Um, so looking at uh, human behaviours, looking at the relationships that people have with brands today, but also looking at how our brains process technology and communications. Because there's a lot of chat. There was something uh, in the press this morning saying how our brains had completely changed because of Facebook and things like that. So is that true? Isn't that true? And how true is, uh, is that for millennials and centennials? Uh, so are they really this alien species? Or is, it, uh, is the answer slightly different? And I suppose as an agency based on sort of uh, different relationships with different brands and different types of people, you would think we might say that uh, they are different species, or would we? So what we're going to, uh, myself and uh, Helen will talk about today, is uh, focusing on sort of four areas. So what are the real differences between millennials and centennials? And uh, we're going to make that easy for me, anyway, by showing you a bit of a video about that. Um, but then we're going to talk about what we believe is a bit of a generation Tinder mindset that connects uh, both segments. Um, then we're going to talk about the, the kind of brand relationships we think they are actually prepared to have with your brands today. And then we'll finish with how we believe brands can actually engage. What do you need to do with this learnings? Rather than just leave you hanging there, what can you do? Which for me is probably three things. Thinking people first, um, thinking about ease, something that's been touched on already this afternoon. And finally, really importantly, given millennials and centennials the relationship that they want with your brand today, not the relationship that we used to want them to have with our brand. So the easy bit first, if you could just play the video, that would be great. <laughs> son watching cats and cucumbers. Um, it's a bit of a flashback there. Um, so I think there's some really interesting examples, but let's um, talk about some others in terms of those differences. Um, 
FOMO versus JOMO. Now, I think it's important to think about what the real difference are about any generations, whether it's millennials and centennials or any others. Because I think for us, it's really important to pull apart the difference between what the behaviours are and uh, those changes, which are obvious in that video, and the actual changes in the mindset. So, good example, uh, I'm sure you'll know, fear of missing out versus joy of missing out. Uh, millennials, digital pioneers, they kind of embraced tech and social media slightly later in their life, so you know, they are more liable to be FOMO people. Whereas centennials um, are very much true digital natives, so you know, they've pretty much grown up with tech and social media at the heart of their lives. So they're kind of more able to see the reasoning for mediating and filtering. For example, be much more happy to not be on Facebook. Um, so they, I'll describe them more as German people. Then another one, uh, Rinster versus Finster. Um, so I think, the, I think it's what is more interesting here is these cut across uh, both millennials and centennials. And in case you're wondering, I'm sure you do know, uh, it's about having a real Instagram account and having a fake Instagram account. I don't know if there's any out, out there of you who've got real. I've got, anybody got two Instagram accounts? You're not going to admit it, are you? Um, so I think, you know, the point is uh, for millennials and centennials, with your Rinster, you absolutely show yourself warts and all because that is the account that you're going to open up to your inner circle of family and friends. So that is completely uh, without filter. Whereas with your Finster account, you create content and you absolutely show a, a better version of yourself. So that's all, either to your wider circle of friends or work contacts. So I think for us, it's really interesting how technology uh, on social media is changing people's behaviors. But yet again, how much is it actually changing these mindsets? So just digging a bit deep, deeper into that, we uh, did some neuroscience research uh, across the generations and obviously including millennials and centennials, looking at how they managed technology and communication. So particularly how well are these generations coping with digital, social and multi-screening? So I think there's that whole thing about they're, they're juggling it in a way that we probably never could. And they're, you know, they're on top of it and like I say, there's a school of thought that their brains are changing and they can do all this multitasking. I think the truth that we d discovered in this research is neither of these groups is coping well either. They're both sort of at their maximum cognitive load and they're both what we would describe as sort of pancake people. You know, just like us, they feel like they're spread too wide and too thin. So really, I think it's a myth that... Uh, they're coping with this new digital age. Yes, they behave differently, but they still struggle in the same ways. And what we find is it's therefore affecting uh, their behaviors in terms of technology, brands, and hum human communications. So I think both millennials and centennials are having deep and shallow relationships with people and brands now. And I think the important point, we touched on Tinder, is it's accelerated by technology, both for brands and human beings. And I think the important thing is, it's still behaviors, not the fundamentals of what it means to be a human being. So who would think that we'd be pulling up a quote from, I think it's the 1950s, uh, in terms of uh, Bill Bernbach, but for us, it still really applies, because I think that the truth is, the world around millennials and centennials has changed much more than their worldview. And I think we often miss that when we get excited about segments. And most of this change <laughs> has been enabled by technology. So I think the danger is we look at these different groups as polar opposites, whereas they're along a spectrum. And they still have a shared mindset. And, you know, as Bill Bernberg said, we're smarter when we think of connecting as brands with the unchanging man rather than the changing man. I think it's too easy to get too excited and Hells is going to come up, uh, cover some campaigns, I think, that do the changing bit rather than the unchanging bit because millennials and centennials still want relationships with your brands. It's just that technology has enabled them to be different and more fleeting, um, just in the same way that Tinder has 
for human relationships. So, um, swipe right came up only 20 minutes ago. I think so. One of our sort of points here is there is a mindset that we've described as Generation Tinder that cuts across multiple generations, including millennials and centennials. And I, I call it a Generation Tinder mindset, but you could as just as easily describe them as uh, Generation Impatient. Um, the reason is the fact that they are struggling with cognitive load just as much as anyone else means that they put value on ease, accessibility, uh, and value itself over loyalty. And they value fleeting and shallow relationships as much as they value longer and deeper relationships. And what we found in our research is actually um, they value the, the, the fleeting and shallow relationships sometimes more than the deeper relationships. And I think that for us, as marketing people, that's a bit of a challenge. You know, it's understanding that there's nothing wrong with those shallow relationships. We just need to manage it in that sort of swipe left, swipe right men mentality. And I think the really interesting thing, uh, if you look at other studies, is that that whole swipe right, swipe left piece is actually becoming like a neurological reward. So flitting around brands, uh, doing stuff like Tinder, uh, using uh, apps that are well designed is actually creating a buzz in people's minds that is, is rewarding in itself. So it's another kind of uh, challenge in terms of loyalty. And I think it's that, these kind of things that we need to focus on and not let segmentation get in the way. So um, we've come up with 14 uh, relationships that people uh, within the millennials, centennials, and broader than that are having with brands today. Um, and you'll probably be pleased that I didn't just cook these up in the last six months. I think it's really interesting that uh, a lady called uh, Susan Fournier came up with the startings of these about 20 years ago. She uh, started uh, in advertising in, uh, at Young and Rubicum in New York and realized none of it made any sense and went off and became a professor. So, uh, so she's been at this for quite a long time. But I think the really important thing that we found still today is we still talk about brand love but when we talk to millennials and centennials, yes, they will talk about committed relationships with a very few brands, but they'll also talk about the value of fleeting and shallow relationships that are based on ease, value, and accessibility. So within these 14 relationships, um, you'll see different types. So yes, you have got deeper and more rewarding relationships like uh, a committed partnership, or uh, an arranged marriage, or you might have some, or a dependency, but you've also got these more shallow relationships like uh, friends with benefits, uh, flings, and secret affairs. Now, that is terminology that this, the, this generation is quite happy to talk about in terms of how they relate to your brands, particularly uh, the friends with benefit one is the, the really interesting one. So I'm now gonna hand over to Helen, who is, I'm uh, going to talk you through some of the examples of brands who are getting this right. Thank you. So it's no accident that Neil gets to talk about the deep relationships and I get to talk about the shallow ones. For those of you that know me in the room, I thought you'd enjoy that. Should be the other way around, actually. <laughs> um, so I guess the question becomes is how do you make fleeting relationships meaningful? Um, and I think, as Neil said already, the good news is that Gen Generation Tinder really values these kind of fleeting and shallow relationships with brands as much as they do a kind of longer and deeper relationships. And in fact, these kind of fleeting relationships, they often value more. Marketeers tend to treat millennials and centennials as this kind of alien species, when in fact, they are just people on a spectrum of behavior. While it's true, they of course have grown up at different stages of, their digital age, of the digital age with some of their kind of technological behaviours differing. However, it's not enough to qualify them as entirely different people. Yes, one prefers the pointedness and privacy of Snapchat rather than the kind of voyeuristic slot machine that is Facebook. But both swipe right. The only difference is that one is more deliberate than the other. But what binds them together is this kind of genera generation tender mindset that values ease, accessibility, and value above brand love. So I'm going to give a few examples um, that I'm just about to kind of take you through now of the kind of fleeting variety. 
Um, so, first up, McDonald's. I mean, it's a brand who, in communications terms, is telling us that we're all loving it. However, when we ask people, do they ever eat McDonald's, um, they typically don't admit to it. McDonald's? No, no, I'd, I'd never have a McDonald's. No, I'd never do it. But our research, when we did it, told us something very different. It told us something else. It uncovered the truth of what people say they do and what they actually do, and it's often two very different things. And people, well, they stated they didn't have a relationship with McDonald's, but their behavioural diaries uh, on a kind of, mostly on a Friday or a Saturday night, revealed the truth of that they were actually having this kind of secret fling relationship with McDonald's. And this was true of sort of over 60% uh, uh, of the time. And we think, actually, this provides a really great opportunity for brands and a really great opportunity for McDonald's to market against this mindset, to do some really clever kind of moment marketing or maybe some interesting things around mobile at those moments when people are having that kind of secret fling relationship. Frustratingly, though, McDonald's gave us this campaign, and I, my apologies to any McDonald's people in the room, but <laughs> the man's face, I think, in this picture kind of says it all. It's kind of a confusing, cryptic emoji campaign, which kind of, rather than being down with the kids, it's just frankly too laborious and difficult to kind of work out. By comparison, a brand that has absolutely kind of got it right <coughs> is Domino's. They seem to understand their role better and they've, uh, with a kind of clever call via a tweet emoji to order mechanic that they unveiled last year. And th their campaign, which is called Anywhere, it taps into a behaviour and a mindset of give me what I want, when I want it and how I want it. And with the added benefit for this audience of preferably not having to speak to anyone. And you simply use the emoji uh, pizza slice and either tweet or text it to get your order. We've heard kind of conversations today about kind of Uber and what have you, but I guess sadly for me, I think a, a, a brand that has suffered from kind of missing out and understanding this Tinder mindset is the Hackney Carriages, London Black Cabs. Uh, it's a brand who has a far, far superior service, but just hasn't adopted quick, en quick enough for Generation Tinder. And Uber came in, they saw this opportunity, and they swept in and challenged the taxi industry by building a brand that was fundamentally based, based on ease, value, and accessibility. And what's interesting, I think, recently is how Uber even offered cabbies the chance to kind of use their app free of charge um, so that both brands could kind of coexist together in this sharing economy, but still believing that kind of great service is going to kind of reign and is enough. There's still ongoing resistance from kind of black cabs. Contrast this with EasyJet, uh, a brand who has brilliantly understood this kind of millennial and centennial mindset. Um, interestingly, in our research, when we sort of ask people what's the airline that they love, they typically will answer you British Airways. But when it came to kind of the airline that they were off spending their money with, they were meanwhile having a friends with benefit relationship with EasyJet. And what EasyJet has brilliantly done is they have literally applied ease right the way through their organisation. They have sorted out their service proposition, their kind of boarding issues. They've made it easy to book a flight anytime, anywhere. Whether, you know, the fact that I can be on the number four bus and literally book a flight uh, via their app, I think is a really kind of crucial factor for this audience. And they are a brand that focuses on making people's lives easier and better. And they've done that particularly through technology. And they recognise that if technology has helped them offer a better way uh, to break through the kind of old trench war of just changing brand perceptions. And I've actually, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but in their kind of recent advertising, they're even now calling themselves Generation EasyJet. Um, moving away from kind of the travel industry and moving into banks and utility brands. And frankly, these areas did not fare at all well in our research. Um, they were often described as enslavement relationships, feeling trapped and too difficult to get out of. Ooh, ouch. Um, I think, interestingly, that's why First Direct was, for kind of my generation, and I can't claim, unfortunately, to be a millennial, 
Um, it was such a great bank at the time. It delivered against human banking at a time when people wanted to talk to people and, and you could literally talk to them. And people loved First Direct and they really eulogised it uh, as a brand. But what we're noticing recently with, with this particular brand, uh, First Direct, is that actually many reviews like this where people are falling out of love with First Direct. They're falling out of love because technology is actually complicating First Direct's business rather than simplifying it. And it's adding a layer of frustration and a layer uh, rather than ease. And it's seeing many people, unfortunately, and really sadly, kind of walking away. By contrast, uh, a, a bank and a brand that is getting it li right in a lot of ways is uh, Barclays. Uh, with innovations such as their BPay, I don't know if anyone's got one in the room, I'm an, a massive, massive fan of it. But it's essentially a band that gives you contactless on your arm without having to charge anything and without even having to be a Barclays customer. They have created a really liberating user experience that makes purchasing and kind of tapping when you get on the bus and on the tube a lot, lot easier than ever before. And all the while, they are gathering data really cleverly on people, where they shop, where they travel, so that they can no doubt market with greater personalization and relevance in the future. And for one, I certainly know that when I'm ready, ready to kind of sh uh, sort of break off my kind of shackles of my enslavement relationship with First Direct, uh, they will certainly be top of my consideration set. So there's a few examples of how to kind of engage these audiences. You know, ultimately, you've just got to treat them as people. <laughs> they are human beings and just adopt a kind of swipe right mentality. Um, but I suppose if I could sum it up in three ways, Neil touched on this at the beginning, you know, really think people and first, not millennials and centennials. Um, really, really, that's so important. And then use that on, as a focus to make people's lives better versus just the old world approach to be fine if we can just change brand perceptions. Secondly, obviously make it easier. <laughs> Make it easy. The changing relationships people have with brands, coupled with the change in technological behaviours, heralds a new approach to brand comms. And given we now consume five times the amount of information we did 30 years ago, it isn't surprising that Generation Tinder puts ease and accessibility and value above loyalty. So as the saying goes, keep it simple, stupid. And finally, give people the relationship they want with a brand, not the relationship you want them to have with your brand. And do remember, this isn't always brand love. Thank you.